In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, there's a very, very profound statement. It reads like this, Righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness. Now, first of all, we have to understand what is righteousness. Without turning there, I've got this memorized. I'll just go ahead and quote it. Psalms 119 verse 172 says, All thy commandments, the Ten Commandments of God, are righteousness. So when Abraham was declared a righteous man and God imputed righteousness to him, it was because he tried to keep God's holy righteous law. And it says here in Proverbs 14, 34, Righteousness exalts a nation, but notice, but sin is a reproach to any people or to a nation. And sin, according to 1 John 3, verse 4, is the transgression of the law. So if righteousness is keeping the law, the exact opposite is sin, the breaking of God's holy and righteous law. Now in Exodus chapter 19, I want to show something that most people have overlooked in the churches today. And if they would understand this a little more carefully, I think they would understand God's law, his covenant, the new covenant, just a little more. But in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6, Now therefore, this is when God had led Israel up to Mount Sinai, and the God of the Old Testament became the Savior, Jesus Christ, of the New Testament. This is Jesus Christ standing on top of Mount Sinai. Moses standing down in front of the people. And he's got the people all up with barriers around the mountain. Now, uh, this is what God says. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me, notice, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Why? Because they had the holy and righteous laws of God, the Ten Commandments. Now, let's not stop there. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. This is the chapter preceding the giving of the Ten Commandments as it's re-given in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. But we've seen here in Exodus 19 that God wanted to make a covenant with them. He wanted to make them a holy and a righteous nation. He wanted to make them a priesthood so they could show forth his virtue to every nation on earth. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Now therefore, listen, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers gives you. Verse 2, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish from it. So we're not to add or take away from this book that God inspired, gave it to Moses and gave to all the prophets, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So why was it they weren't to add to or take away from? So that they could keep God's commandments and not the commandments of men. This is the key. We're to keep God's commandments, not men's. Now, drop down to verse 5 and 6. 7 and 8 also. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God, this is Moses talking to Israel, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whether you go to possess it. Keep, therefore, and do them. Now, remember what he said, righteousness exalts a nation, but if you disobey those laws and don't keep them, then sin, and it's a disgrace to a nation. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. If we keep God's laws and his statutes and his judgments, at one time the United States had as a penalty for murder, death. And yes, you can look in Exodus 21, 22, and 23, and you can see the judgment that God rendered for murder in the Old Testament Israel was to put that person to death. If you take life, your life is taken. That is a judgment of God. And this was a righteous nation. There was practically no criminality and law breaking in this country. And then those who are trying to destroy our country have infiltrated, they've twisted the laws, They've said human life at all costs should be preserved. Even murderers, in spite of what they've done to the victim. No life for life. But see, they don't understand there is coming a resurrection of the dead. 
and even murderers who have never known the truth of God will be resurrected in the last day and be taught of God. That's what the last day of the Festival of Tabernacles represents. And so since they don't have this understanding, then they won't put someone to death. Plus, they'll turn murderers loose on society to further dismantle us as a nation and cause sin among us. But let's go on. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, listen to what they would say if we would keep these. Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who has God so near unto them? As the, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. Verse 8. And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous? So when ministers stand up and say God's law is bad, it was nailed to the cross because it was harsh, that minister is a false prophet. And I'll stand on that by the word of God because it says right here that all of God's laws, statutes, and judgments are righteous and it will exalt a nation. And then every nation on earth would say, what nation is like this if they would keep them? They're so close to God and they're so wise and they have such understanding. If we will do this law which I set before you this day, this is a fantastic thing. But now, let's turn to Romans chapter 9. This is the New Testament. God's people, ancient Israel, which he chose, he chose them to exalt his name before all the nations, to set an example before all people. They failed. They broke the covenant. And all the books in First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings, are nothing more than a chronology of the law breaking and the breaking of all God's laws, statutes, and judgments and how he finally divorced them and said, I'll have to make a new covenant so that people will obey me. And I'll give them a new heart. It's called God's Holy Spirit so that he can write those same laws, statutes, and judgments into our mind and so that we can become a great people and set the example for the rest of the world. Notice Romans 9 now, verse 1. This is the Apostle Paul talking. He says, I say the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. And this is recorded for us. No, now I'm going to summarize verse 2 and 3. He's saying he wished he would let himself be cut off and he would lose salvation if all physical Israel which had been divorced of God would attain salvation. If they would just turn back to God and accept Jesus Christ, he would willingly give up his own life if all of those could be saved. Now look in verse 4. Who are Israelites? These physical fleshly people, his descendants, or his brothers and sisters in the flesh. They're Israelites to whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants, or the actual Greek word there is testament, and the giving of the law. And we've seen that in Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, and the service of God and the promises. All the promises were given to Israel physical, fleshly Israel. They were given to Abraham, then Isaac, and Jacob, and then they were given to a nation of Israel which God chose to show the rest of the world how great it would be if they would keep all of his laws. Now look in verse 8. This is very dramatic. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, that's physical Israel, these are not the children of God. They're not. The Jews today that claim to be God's chosen people are not the children of God. They are of the flesh. They've broken God's covenant. He divorced them and said he would make a new covenant. But look who are of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. That's you. That's me. That's every person in the world who has God's Holy Spirit. They've truly repented. They've been baptized for the remission of all of their sins. They've received God's Holy Spirit and they're walking after the Spirit and not after the flesh. These are God's chosen people, not the physical Israelites. They were divorced. They could not keep the righteous requirements of God's law, but you and I, through the power of God's Spirit, can do it. Now, I want to read you something, and I think this is very important. There was a unanimous opinion given on February 29, 1892, by the Supreme Court of the United States. I want to read just a part of that opinion. These and many other matters which might be noticed 
add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. This is a Christian nation, so declared by the Supreme Court of the United States and Holy Trinity Church versus the United States. They said, no, we're not going to do away with Christ in this country. We are a Christian nation. We're declared so. And this nation is the one who has been walking after the Spirit in years past and not after the flesh. So we in this country, the Christian heritage in this nation, are of God, or at least we have been. Now I want to show you something else. 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. And this is very dramatic because we need to understand why people are so desperately trying to destroy this nation. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Peter is talking to New Testament Christians. Anyone who now has God's Holy Spirit is a Christian. And you, Christians who have God's Holy Spirit, are a chosen generation. Remember, we just read where it's not the flesh that God made the covenant with at Mount Sinai anymore. It's not those people anymore. They were divorced. Now it's New Testament Christians, those who are in the Spirit, walking after God's Holy Spirit, that is the Christian. That's who the promises are made with. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We have supplanted ancient Israel. We're to do the same thing that they were to do, to show the rest of the world God's ways and holy nation. This is New Testament Christians. This is why the United States of America is such a peculiar treasure among all the other nations of the earth because we were declared by the Supreme Court a Christian nation and we live by the laws of God as a whole. Then let's go on. It says a peculiar people, but that's a gross mistranslation. The word peculiar is not there. It should say, if I can read this with my glasses, I don't have my reading glasses and this is awfully small that I've got written here. A purchased people because we've been purchased with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Then notice what it says, that you, New Testament Christians, who are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Now, the word praises is another mistranslation. It should say, show forth the virtues of and if we're keeping God's law, His statutes, His judgments, then we're showing forth the righteous virtues of God to the rest of the world. This is the New Testament Christian, and this is what this nation was declared. A holy, righteous nation under God. We were a Christian nation. But one thing that I think we can all agree upon, the United States, United States as a nation was totally unique in all of history. There has never been another nation like it. It has been by far the greatest nation which has ever appeared on the world scene. A nation unparalleled in wealth. One that has only 6.6% .6 of the world's population and yet it enjoys over 50% of the wealth of the world at one time. A decade ago, a man by the name of Clinton Royster, R-O-S-S-I-T-E-R, -S -S this man was a historian and also a political scientist at Cornell University. He wrote in Life magazine a series on the national purpose of the United States. And I want to quote what he says. The United States is rightly numbered among those nations for which a benevolent sense of national purpose or, as I prefer, of mission. And what did we see in the New Testament? That we, New Testament Christians, are chosen, a royal generation, and we're to show forth. We have a mission. A mission to show forth the virtue of God to the rest of the world. And he says that we have a mission, has, has been a historical necessity for this people. We have been, like the children of Israel, a peculiar treasure. Upon us has destiny been, bestow, been bestowed such favor. Of us, therefore, it has asked special effort. Men like Washington and Lincoln sensed this grand truth and acted on it. They, he knew that the United States of America had something special about it. And we should too, because we were declared a Christian nation. And that every one of our laws upheld the laws of God. 
To be exact, the Constitution of the United States is the only document ever written which you, as a New Testament Christian, can live under and not violate it or the law of God. It's the only Constitution on the face of the earth where you can live and not violate God's law, and yet you can uphold the Constitution. Not once do you, are you asked to ever violate it. That's the Constitution. But it's been twisted and dismantled today, and we are no longer a republic. Think about it. We pledge allegiance to the republic for which it stands. And yet we're told, democracy, democracy, this was not a democracy. This was a republic where we, the people, are the government. Us, not the federal government of Washington. We just gave them certain authority. And we can take it back as a people if they change and become something other than a republic because God inspired our Constitution. I want to quote from Abraham Lincoln. He said, We find ourselves in the peaceful possession of the fairest portion of the earth as regards fertility of soil, and look at all the crop production we've always had with a breadbasket of the world, extent of territory from the Pacific to the Atlantic, and salubrity of climate. Had the greatest climate in the world until just 1976 when this magnetic, electromagnetic waves have been used to divert the jet stream. We find ourselves the legal inheritors of these fundamental blessings. We toil not in the acquirement or in the establishment of them. We didn't work for them. God gave them to us because we were a Christian people. And just like he gave Palestine to ancient Israel, he gave the United States to us because we were a Christian people. We were walking after the spirit and not after the flesh. Also, on March 30th, 1863, Lincoln made another statement. I'll quote, It is the duty of nations as well as of men. This is nations. And what did it say here in 1 Peter 2 verse 9? We are a peculiar or a holy nation. He said it is the duty of nations as well as of men to owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God. We have been the recipients of the choicest blessings of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But notice his next startling statement. But we have forgotten God. And it was Abraham Lincoln who called for a national day of fasting while the Civil War was going on that God would not allow the destruction of this nation. Now I'll go on with a statement. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Not so. God said if they would keep his statutes, his laws, his judgments, every nation on earth would see that their wisdom came from him. And we were the same way. But Abraham Lincoln saw that this nation was being ripped apart by the Civil War because we had forgotten our God. And that's exactly what's happening to the United States of America today. So most of us in America have grown up thinking that all of these things came about by our own production. It's called human potential in the modern New Age movement. Human beings can produce everything themselves without God. There is no supernatural to produce it. We are sort of a God unto ourselves, and therefore we have to produce or we have to fulfill our fullest potential. That's why they have the ERA movement to relieve women from the home so that they can fulfill their human potential. But I have another statement to make, and that is that we have, have received nothing of our own in this land. We rolled up our sleeves and worked, yes, but God gave this land to us, and we're losing this land because we have forgotten our God. And Abraham Lincoln said it, and it's good to say it again. So it's good that we can just back off occasionally from all the things that are attention grabbers like television, movies, theaters, plays, stage plays, football, baseball, basketball, work. Everything that takes our attention and go back and look and see how the United States of America became great. And then take a look at it, it in comparison to the rest of the world. So let's do that for just a minute. At the end of the 1940s, the United States hit its peak 
It was at its greatest of all time. It had become at that time the greatest nation on the face of the earth. It had a greater percentage of all the world's riches than at any time in history. And no other nation has paralleled it. During this period of time, America had three times as much gold reserve as the entire rest of the world combined. That's rich. We produced 60% of the world's steel. We drove 73% of the world's cars and trucks. This is at the end of World War II. We produced 51% of all the gasoline used around the world and owned 67%. That's two out of three of every telephone on the face of the earth. Americans owned a much greater ratio of radios, refrigerators, freezers, washers, air conditioners, and every luxury item. We had a greater percentage, something like 80% of all luxury items on the face of the earth. This is at the end of World War II. In productive capacity, we far outstripped every nation combined in the world. In technical know-how, we were in a league by ourselves. No one could stand before us. America was the greatest. To be exact, you could say that we were a giant among pygmies as, as far as the rest of the world is, is concerned. So in the years since then, though, I think we can all see that something has gone terribly wrong. Something in America has gone wrong. Instead of the nations of the world being at America's feet as they were after World War II, most of them appear to be at our throats and trying to dismantle us. They're striving to dispose of America, drag us down, and lending to this wholehearted support of Amer as America's enemies as many of the people within our own country. Our own country. And they're trying to discredit America. They're trying to ridicule it. They're trying to undermine our Constitution so that they can merge us into a one-world government. And many of these people are our own politicians and our civic leaders. And they seem to be the ones who are promoting this the most. So when we step back and look objectively, we analyze it at America in the late 40s and compare it with America in 1983, we see that something has shockingly reversed in trends. So what, uh, you might want to say, uh, what is it that we're trying to do? What is our government trying to do? Commit national suicide? It seems to appear that way. But one thing for sure, we can know and apply the scripture that says we're, we're weighed in the balance and found wanting. Remember one of the kings of Israel was weighed in the balance and found wanting? America has become that way because we've forgotten our God. America prides itself on being a have nation, a developed nation. In the United States today, people have more money, more freedom, more opportunities, more privileges, and more luxuries than any nation in history. In fact, Americans enjoy everything that any people just a few decades ago wanted. And they thought if we had all of these things, we would live in a utopian society. And yet the exact opposite has occurred. We've become the most mixed up and unhappy people on the face of the earth. America's had more financial experts than any other nation. And yet its personal and national debts are staggering. It actually boggles the mind to think about the debt in this country. America has more medical experts than any other nation on the face of the earth, and yet America is the sickest nation and has more chronic diseases than any other nation on earth. Now, the life expectancy is longer in this nation, true, but they have more chronic diseases than any other nation on earth. And America has an abundance of marriage counselors. They're called experts. And yet, one out of two marriages as of the end of 1982 has ended up in divorce. And many of the others are barely hanging on with a small, thin thread. So America has, de has developed super technology to the point where they can send men to the moon. They sent three to the moon, walked on the moon, they came back. They did all this safely, not one hitch involved. And yet, this fantastic capability to communicate, and yet we can't even communicate with ourselves. They can send transmissions from the moon to the earth perfectly. They can send transmissions for all the way from Jupiter 
billion or millions of miles away and yet we can't even communicate with our own husbands and our wives and our children so our homes are ripped apart. I want to quote from January 1st, 1970, a column by Mr. James Reston. I quote, It would be a foolish man who denied the plain facts. We are an overpopulated, under-civilized, divided, corrupted, and bewildered, destitute of faith, and terrified of skepticism people. War, crime, pollution, racial tension, political cynicism, and pessimism are our daily companions. Now this is true, and yet this was not the case in the 18, 1900s. It was not the case up to practically World War II. So America's allies around the world are very deeply concerned about our commitment to a free world. To be exact, I want to read a quote from what the Australians stated. This was found in the Los Angeles Times, November 2nd, 1969. I quote, For more than a quarter of a century, Australians have placed particular reliance upon the United States. This is Robert S. Elegant who was writing this particular article. He said, But recently, there's been a massive loss of confidence in the United States among Australians. Most Australians have been dismayed by the apparent collapse of American resolution. Remember, in the sermons I gave, you shall have no other God before me. If we would have the Lord our God who became Jesus Christ of the New Testament and him and no one before him, we would ride on the high places of the earth. He would fight all of our battles for us. We would never have to con have a conflict with anybody. He would fight and win all of our battles for us. And yet now, the American resolution is gone. I'll continue the quote. Even if Australia has nowhere else to go for security, Australians have concluded that they cannot trust the United States because the United States no longer trusts itself. A massive loss of confidence. And that's the way it is everywhere. But then when you look at the Asians, what do they think about it? There was an article that appeared in the Oregonian, this is up in the state of Oregon. December 26, 1967, I'll quote from it. Asian, the Asians view of the United States as a short-lived rocket, a phenomenon which arose without the travail and handicap that restricted other nations. So the Asians look at us as a people who came over here and suddenly we just mushroomed to greatness when they've been over there for thousands of years with their roots in the soil. They've had children on the same soil generation after generation they're deeply rooted but we don't have these roots since it lacks deep roots in the past they believe that it cannot be expected to last into the future it will go out like a rocket or topple over like a giant weed this is the way the Asians look at you and me and everyone in this country and I'll go on Yes, it would be a foolish man who denied the plain facts from a position of unprecedented power and world esteem. This is after World War II. America has, in a remarkably few years, plummeted to a position of virtual moral and financial bankruptcy. This is the America which God gave us and which our Supreme Court declared was a Christian nation. So 30 years ago, the image which the United States of America projected around the world was one of a colossal, powerful, vibrantly alive, and fantastically rich, benevolent giant who could confidently be trusted to lead the world into the challenges of the future. And yet today, in the process of time, this particular image of the United States has been eroded. It has become a tarnished image an image which has been dented through warfare. It's been chipped. It's been smashed and broken so as to be totally unacceptable to the rest of the nations of the world. Now, the question is, as we begin into the third century of our nationhood, can we, with this up-to-date image, be received loud and clear around the world as one who will lead the nations of the earth? We were leading the world as long as we were keeping the laws of our God, the statutes and the judgments. And as long as we lived them in our personal, everyday lives, we were the greatest nation on the face of the earth. There can be nothing in the history books to disprove that. Everything is in favor of it. But this new image, 
is one of a lumbering, stumbling, bumbling, and a grumbling dolt who staggers from one crisis to another through a blinding haze of fear. And we do fear in this country. And indecision, and indecision by our lawmakers at every turn has caused the collapse of this country. It's one of, the, it's one of a disputed or a dissipated Dissipated is the word I'm looking for. Giant. We're just crumbling before the world and their very eyes, and there's a reason for it. We're sort of a nation now that wants to just shut our eyes. We want to give an appearance to the rest of the world, but we want the rest of the world to leave us alone so that we can go into a mammoth orgy of crime and violence. It's exactly what we've been doing for the last 20 years especially. We've now created an image to the rest of the world of a terribly sick giant who having changed our God-given Christian heritage and we've sold it for a bowl of atheistic, socialistic pottage. That's exactly what the rest of the world thinks about us now. So that we have lost our sense of destiny. We've purged from our mind any trace of morality. We've rebelled against the laws of God. We've rebelled against the statutes of God. And there's a handful of people here and there, and that's all that's willing to go all the way with God. We've now created such an image of degeneracy that who can trust us? Because as the Australian says, we don't even trust ourselves, so how can they trust us? We've become such a giant, fumbling, bumbling. We've become neurotic. We gulp down pills in prodigious amounts as a population. Pills that pep us up. Pills to wake us up. Pills to speed ourselves up. Pills to slow ourselves down. Pills and drugs to help us escape from the alarming reality that the United States is crumbling and falling and is going to be a past tense nation. So many in the free world are sitting back in amusement. They are loving it because they want to destroy this last hope for the world to merge us into a one world government and yet those who are freedom lovers all over the world are frightened they're scared stiff because they know once the United States of America crumbles we have no hope the world will fall under the socialist communist international bankers conspiracy they know it so when we review about 50 years of the FBI the late J. Edgar Hoover made this quote and I'll read it whether we like it or not, the morals to which we subscribe as a people are vital for our survival as a free nation. Vital. The morals which we had as the laws, the statutes, and the judgments of God in the Bible were vital to our survival as a free nation. Now, can you begin to understand why they are trying to pretend and create an image for J. Edgar Hoover that he was a homosexual? that he was not a Christian man so that they can cause you to lose all confidence in any statement that he would ever make because this is absolute truth. I'll continue the quote. Concerned citizens are beginning to wonder if we may not be in grave danger of rejecting those things which are the source of our nation's strength. Are we entering an age that must end in anarchy? Are we rearing a generation almost wholly lacking in self-discipline? In short, do we deserve our magnificent inheritance? Are we good enough to preserve the great republic to which we have pledged our allegiance? Will we, re will we as a nation, retain the capacity to do our duty as Americans? The conclusion has to be no because someone has done something to undermine our Christian heritage. I want to give another quote from the late police chief Parker of Los Angeles, who was a fine Christian man, or at least he claimed to be, and he tried to live the best he knew how by the laws of God. I quote, It is very hard for me to believe that our society can continue to violate all the fundamental rules of human conduct and expect to survive. I think that I have to conclude that this civilization, and he's talking about our country, will destroy itself as others have before it. 
This leaves only one question, when? Will America go out the way the Asians said, like a big rocket that's just going to fizz out or topple over like a giant weed? Well, for the last 30 years, many people who love freedom and who love this Bible and who are Christian and know where their inheritance came from in this country have been quite concerned. Abraham Lincoln looked forward to a time and he actually saw in vision, you might say, or insight, and he recognized that no foreign power could come in and invade the United States and destroy it. He said if we were to lose our nationality, it would have to be from within. And I want to give his quote. At what, time, at what point, then, is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up among us as a nation. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, so if it ever comes to us, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die of suicide. There can never be a moment of, uh, in our waking lives that we, can't, we don't have to work to preserve our republic and our constitutional rights because there have been conspiracies for centuries of people coming into nations and overthrowing that, those nations. And this particular speech was given by Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois, January of 1837. So Lincoln clearly understood that the only real danger facing America was not from invaders who would march in, but those who would come up from among us who would subvert what is called the American spirit. And that spirit is of Christianity. And once we subvert Christianity and the love for God has grown cold and we turn away, then we can be subverted and overthrown and merged into a one world government. So the subverting of the American spirit has been taking place increasingly and with intensity, especially in the last few years, but for about 70 years, and with the last 20 years with intensity to destroy every basic fundamental foundation of Christianity that we have in this nation. So when the American nation entered into the 20th century in 1900, it was very basically a sound nation. And it really did. It throbbed with life and vitality. It had a very good spirit about it. Most people were deeply patriotic. They were religious. The church buildings were filled, not only on the Sabbath, and I realize many people are deceived about Sunday worship, but at least they did express a, a love for Jesus Christ, even though they were in error on that particular point. But they lived by definite standards of morality, and that was at least nine of the Ten Commandments. They left out the Sabbath, but they did at least have the other nine commandments. And even when I was growing up as a teenager and going to church on Sunday, I was taught nine of the Ten Commandments. And so many of the churches do teach that, but they're deceived into believing the Sabbath. But they respected their country. They were patriotic. They loved their neighbors, and they loved themselves, and they loved their neighbors as themselves, and they would go out of their way to help one another. They kept spiritually the Ten Commandments overall. The home and the family were held in very high esteem. Divorce was very rare at that particular time. Men were masculine. Women were feminine and they loved every minute of it. And both sexes were content with their natural roles that God had given in the Bible. As a result, we were a Christian nation. The Supreme Court declared us so. God poured out His blessings upon this nation as no other nation in the history of the world. But since that time, all these pillars of a sound society have been eroding little by little until they've reached the point where the average person is left without any set of clearly defined principles. Because you see, the word God is taken out of our schools. And the word Jesus Christ can't be spoken except in cursing and swearing. And so as a result, we don't even know that it's wrong to steal. We don't know there's a law that says you shall not commit adultery, so sex sins are running rampant in this country. So we're left as a people floundering in doubt, fear, indecision, a nation without any transcendental goals or real purpose for which God originally set us out as a Christian nation for, to show forth His virtue to the world. For a while we did it, but now those things have eroded. 
So the result, just look around. I don't believe any of us can deny the fruit of what is around us. Every phase of society seems to be gnawing away at our vitals, showing that there, this nation is crumbling in decency everywhere. The true state of the nation is reflected in its leading institutions. Education, it's defunct of the word God. When you leave God out of the scene, there is no other way to educate yourself. God is the foundation of all knowledge. The fear of God, that's the beginning of wisdom. And when you have no fear of God, there's nowhere to go. You can educate the brain, you can have literal facts, but without the spiritual development of man, you're left aimless and wondering, what's this all about? Therefore, you can live any way you want with no moral principles. You can sleep around with anyone you want, anytime you want. You can steal, you can pillage, you can plunder the company you work for. It makes no difference when you have no moral standards. It's reflected in the churches today. Homosexual, gay rights in churches trying to make these men pastors when God says it's an abomination and he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, what he called with eternal fire where every building literally was disintegrated into atoms and where it burned up everything and even the grass and there was not anything left. And he said, this is what's going to be for anyone who is a homosexual and refuses to repent. And yet the churches are accepting it. You can find our degeneracy in our literature. Just go to any 7-Eleven store and ask them, would you hand me a penthouse? Would you hand me a Playboy? Would you hand me what, 109 or 10 different varieties of totally nudity and perversion of the human body? You can see it in our music, the hard rock. You can see it in government where they have no decisions except bad decisions that are destroying us. You can see it in the home where one out of two end up in divorce. The children are the ones who suffer the most. So all of this is mirrored. All of these basic things that are destroying America are, mirror, are actually mirrored in our financial mess also. In this country alone, our national debt of the United States government is over $1 trillion. And when you add all up the personal debts to go with it, it's over $5 trillion. More than all the building and real estate in this country combined. That's the debt that we have in this country. Yes, I believe we can say that America today can be likened to a desperately sick man whose body is racked with every type of terminal disease there is, and yet his eyesight is failing, his hearing is failing, his limbs are going weak, they're crippled with arthritis, his mental state is rapidly deteriorating, so there can't be any constant right decisions made in high places. His heart's beginning to fail, and cancer is eating him. This nation is going down. But what went wrong to this great country that was declared a Christian nation where every principle of the Bible was upheld and where we were the most glorious nation on earth? What went wrong? What has turned the American dream into the American nightmare? What has done it? What has caused the land of the free and the land of the brave to become the land of the coward and the land of the imprisoned? What has done it? What's come over us as a nation? What are the causes for the effects that we see all around us? Our homes and our families falling apart with mind-shattering rapidity. You just can't go down and look in the courthouses where you don't see a whole list of divorce, divorce, divorce. I, I realize there are many that are legal in God's sight and should be, but then there most are not. Our schools and colleges do nothing but spawn, spawn alienation. It's called a generation gap between children and their adult parents. It spawns frustration. VD infested pill poppers whose whole lives are wrapped up in Proverbs 16.25. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. This is exactly what our school systems are producing today. And they don't care about our posterity. They say, let our posterity be damned. We don't care that we were a Christian nation. We don't care if our heritage came out of the Bible. Forget it. And when they say that, we're on our way out. And we're not going to have a nation for our children to grow up in. 
but our courts are even forcing law-abiding citizens to have padlocks on their doors and double locks to make sure that nothing is stolen or their lives are not endangered. While the criminals are free on the streets, they can terrorize the population. Our government, this is local, federal, state, doesn't matter. It just grows and grows and grows. While they, because of this growth, they have to tax, tax, and tax because they want to spend, spend, and spend. <laughs> and so our nation groans under our mind-boggling national debt of over $1 trillion and our personal debt of over $5 trillion. No wonder something has gone wrong. But what is it? Throughout all strata of society today, we see lying, that's breaking one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not bear false witness. Deceit, that's lying also, because if you don't tell somebody the whole truth, then you're only telling a half-truth. That's what Satan did. Did God say that you shouldn't eat at the tree of the garden, the girls in the garden of good and evil? Okay, he left a question in their mind. See, deceit, half-truths, that's the way of Satan. Graft is everywhere in business, in industry, in government. Corruption and hypocrisy on a monumental scale. It's the order of the day. You're strange if you're not a part of it. Doesn't it say in Peter that they, those of the world, will think it's strange that you don't run to the same excess of riot? Oh yes. If you're honest and if you don't pillage, you don't steal, you don't lie, you don't sleep around with anybody and you keep God's law, you're going to be the oddball. So there is no soundness in society anymore. But what's happened to us? Now, I want to ask a question. Have we fallen prey to some strange national curse? Is it a disease of some kind, some mental disease or neuroses? Did we fall accidentally into our present condition? Or were we deliberately pushed? I want to make a statement. Remember all the way back in the Garden of Eden, after six days, the sixth day God created Adam. Then he put him in a deep sleep. He took a rib out of his sight and he created the woman. And he brought them together. What happened immediately after that? Satan came on the scene. And Satan, man, had not sinned until Satan came on the scene and he deceived them. Man didn't fall from grace. He was pushed deliberately by Satan. He was undermined. And so it is. I ask, could there be a deliberate conspiracy in our land to destroy us as a Christian nation? The idea of a massive conspiracy or a hidden hand, a secret force guiding the nations through many, many years and centuries to finally come up with a one world government to where we would literally worship Satan as the human or who is in who has taken over the body of a man and called the Antichrist or beast, and we would worship him as God. Could it be that he has been guiding nations? He has been sending his agents to destroy all civilized governments for the very purpose of raising up this end time final social system so that we would be so massively deceived as a population that we would worship him as God? I believe this is what's happening. I believe that when you look at all the facts and the evidence that I've been presenting and that many, many more people that I have learned these things from also, when you look at all the honest facts and you have to come up with a conclusion, there is a massive conspiracy on the world scene. And the greatest conspirator of all is Satan the devil. He's the one who conspired against Adam and Eve. He's the one that created or brought about the first sin through deception. And so it is. This concept of a conspiracy is not new at all. There's been other people who've written about it. Some of them back in the 18th century, like Professor John Robinson, then the Abbey Burrell in Europe, the Duke of Northumberland, also Sir Walter Scott, Nesta Webster, and I've got some of her books. And she actually goes through and shows the socialist communist conspiracy starting way back in the 1800s. 
and shows and goes through and names the organizations and how they interlink one with the other all over the world and yet they look like this is an independent organization, this one's independent, but they all work together and interconnect and call, they're called networks and cells. And all of these things work together. And in the United States of America today, there's over 10,000 just in this country alone in the New Age movement. But there are other well-known people who believe that there is a plot to destroy the Christian world. Winston Churchill was one of them, and he spoke out very heavily against it. And then suddenly, he lost his position or his post in government in England. And then he had a strange meeting with some Rothschilds who happened to be one of the top conspirators in the world and heads up international banking. And then suddenly Winston Churchill, who was at, it was stated in books that he was finished as a politician in England because he went head to head up against those who were conspiring for world government. Suddenly he was put back into the top position in England. And then history now bears out that he and Franklin Delano Roosevelt and others in both governments of England and the United States literally sold out Europe to the Russians. And they sold out to those working for a one world government and that's the only reason he was reinstituted as the Prime Minister of England. Another man, Benjamin Disraeli, and he wrote a book called Conning Conningsby. And he stated in there that the world is being ruled by far different personages than you and I think because we're not behind the scenes. And he said there were 300 Jewish people on the continent of Europe and the United States who were massively wealthy. And they were the ones who controlled every government on earth through economics. And Benjamin Disraeli was one of them working for them in the Parliament of England. And Lord... Sydenham of England is another one who says there is a conspiracy. Henry Ford I wrote an entire book about it. H.G. Wells, Taylor Caldwell, Charles Lindbergh Sr., and Henry Cabot Lodge Sr., all of these have written and spoken about the conspiracy to destroy all civilized nations and to merge it into a one-world socialist communist government. So when we view all the appalling and never-ending parade of blunders which our government, now this is errors, mistakes uh, that our government has stumbled into over the past 40 years. When we look at that, we have to say, it looks like somebody could make at least one decision correct for our country. I want to give a quote by Gary Allen. This man wrote a book called None Dare Call It Conspiracy, page 8. If we were merely dealing with the law of averages, Half of the events affecting our nation's well-being should be good for America. If we were dealing with mere incompetence, our leaders should occasionally make a mistake in our favor. I think we can all agree on that. Usually, even going out and playing basketball, most teams win one, lose one. They're at least 50-50. Well, surely our government leaders could make at least half the decisions that's for the good of our country. Well, let's go on and see what he says. We are not really dealing with coincidence or stupidity, but we are dealing with planning and brilliance. That's why America is being destroyed, because they are turning us against God and they know history and they state so in the protocols. Any nation that turns us back upon certain basic fundamental truths, that nation, every nation in history has gone down the tubes. And so they know history well. Well, there are many leading academic, um, well, smart people in the United States. And they openly profess that there is a hidden hand guiding the affairs of a state in this country and that other nations around the world. And I want to give one quote today to set you up for the next sermon I give. And I think it's going to be Dynamite, Not because I'm giving it. I hope you understand that because it, it's truth. That's why. And you have to listen to what somebody says. I don't care if they're a good speaker, boring speaker. If you listen to what they say and you get something good from it, it's not a boring speech. It's good. So, Dr. Carol Quigley. Now, you have to understand who this man is. He was a professor of history at the Foreign Service School of Georgetown University. 
Georgetown University is the number one school in this country who is putting out people to actively work for a one world government. And he headed up the whole school of history. Now, listen to what he says, and I quote from his book, Carol Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope, page 950. Here it is. There does exist and has existed for a generation an international network which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believe the communists act. So Christians who they consider on the right believe the communists are all the way on the left. They're atheists. They're the exact opposite. So he says there has existed and he's been a part of it. We're going to see just a minute. In fact, this network, which we may identify as the round table groups, this all started in England with Lord Milner. That's a part of, he's the one that formed the round table, but he did it with the, with the uh, direction of the Rothschilds in an area in downtown London, England. There is a city like the Vatican. It's not a part of London. It's not a part of England. It's a city, and they call it the city. And when the Queen of England goes into the city, she has to stop and wait for the doorman to let her in and lead her in. And then she bows before the people who rule that city. These are the people who are going to rule the world in this one world government. They're the ones who formulated the round table. So anyway, let me go on. In fact, this network, which we may identify as the round table groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the communist or any other group and frequently does so. I know of the operations of this network because here's why he knows he's writing this big, huge, massive thousand page book because he knows. I have studied it for 20 years and listen to this, and was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. This man knows. That's why he wrote the book Hope and Tragedy. He knows that it's here and there's no turning back. And when Christians will not participate in it, there's going to be tragedy. Because they're going to kill us. Just, they're going to hurt us up just like we're cattle and slaughter us. Just like they did in Russia and China. I have no aversion to it, he says. <laughs> no aversion to it. Or to most of its aims. And have for much of my life been close to it and to many of its instruments, its different arms. I have objected both in the past and recently to a few of its policies. That's why he left. But in general, my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown. It's working behind the scenes. It wants to be anonymous. And for you and I, not even to know it exists. I believe its role in history is significant and enough to be known. That's why he left it, because its role in history is so significant that he felt everyone should at least know what they're working and striving for. Just another couple of um, sentences here. Now I'm going to bring it to a close today because it is so hot. But another top flight educator. This man's name is Dr. Revilo P. Oliver. He is the professor of classical studies at the University of Illinois. And he states in his book, Conspiracy or Degeneracy, page 8, he says that he knows for absolutely certain that there is a massive conspiracy on the world scene. So the only honest and totally sincere standard of which we can make any decisions and ask and answer, is there a conspiracy today? Is it, can we prove it? Or did we just happen to drift away from our Christian heritage? Can we prove it? And if so, does it fit with Bible prophecy? And if it does, then we better believe it. Now I want to give, as a final statement today, the words of Benjamin Disraeli in his book, Conning's, Conningsby page 249 and 252. The world is governed by very different personages from what is imagined by those who are behind the scenes. Brethren, next time I want to go into the topic who rules the world and I think it's going to be very enlightening to all of us.